the recording will now begin. I'll just pass to Julie for the setting it and apologies. Thanks. Thank you and good morning, members. Deputy Provost Claire Leach. Yeah. Provost Jim Todd. Here. Councillor Stephen Canning. Present, thanks. Councillor Ellen Freel. I'm here, thanks, Julie. Councillor John McFadgen. Here, Julie. Thank you. Councillor John McGee. Here. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Here. Councillor Maureen Mackay. Present. Councillor David Richardson. Present. Councillor James Adams. Thank you. I have an apology from Councillor Lillian Jones. Councillor Ian Linton. Here. Councillor Douglas Reid. Here. Councillor Graham Barton. Here. Councillor Graham Boyd. Here, Julie. Councillor Barry Douglas. Here. Councillor Neil Ingram. Here. Councillor Peter Mabin. Here. Councillor Claire Maitland. Here. Councillor Beverly Clark. Here. Councillor Sally Cogley. Here. Councillor Kevin McGregor. Here, thank you. Councillor Linda Holland. Here, thanks. Councillor William Lennox. Morning, here. Councillor Alison Simmons. Here. Thank you. Councillor Billy Crawford. Present. Councillor Jane Kyle. Present. <coughs> Councillor Jim McMahon. Yeah, Julie, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Neil Watts. Uh, here, Julie. Thank you. Councillor Drew Felson. Yeah. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. Yes, I'm here, thank you. And Councillor Elaine Stewart. Yep, here, thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. So before we kick off into council business, we have a really special presentation to give to Elsie Cook. So I'll just move up to the uh, lectern if I could invite you to join me up there, Elsie. Thanks. I oh, was certainly. Are. <laughs> um, so, everybody, this is Elsie Cook. Uh, Elsie fell in love with football in the 1960s when she was 13 years old and she had just been to see her first match at Rugby Park. And after mm -hmm. that, she decided that she wanted to play. And I'll tell you what stories we've heard there in the Men's Lounge, what a carry on you've all had <laughs> when you were younger. I love to hear it. Some things you can't tell. Ah, you're right. Um, so, this is at a time where women were actually banned for playing football in Scotland. And Elsie just didn't want to accept this. She was passionate. She wanted to play football and she didn't ever see why lasses and women should not be able to play football, recognising that women have absolutely every capability that men do. She was a, described as a pioneer, a trailblazer, and she's fought for equality in the sporting world. And she worked tirelessly for years to reverse the ban. <laughs> Which was eventually lift, lifted in 1974. Mm. Fight for women still go on to this day in so many areas. So thank you for being part of history where you champion women and I feel obliged to, to, to say thank you for that. So during the ban, girls and women weren't allowed to play in any proper pitches or use any referees or other officials, but that didn't let them stop them. They'd sneak on to council run grounds on Sundays when nobody else was playing to play their games. Elsie's devoted so much of her life to battling for women's football players to have the same rights and respect as men. She made it a life mission to expand the game of football for girls and women of all ages, describing herself in interviews as a football suffragette from 1961 to 1993. Love it. She's helped found the women's the Scottish Women's Football Association in 1972, and she organised the first official international women's football game for the team. Mayor. <laughs> I don't doubt it. <laughs> so, 1974, after the ban was lifted, Elsie retired as the secretary of the Scottish Women's FA, and she became the manager of the women's team. Much to her husband, this oh may, if I remember were you telling me right enough. After a short stint as manager, she dedicated her time to expanding the game for girls. She got incredible stories about meeting Pele in the Brazilian men's team. I've seen your picture in the paper with Pele, it was so good. Um, and getting a call for Joe Steen, asking a women's team to provide pre-match entertainment for the European Cup final. She's also a rocker 
and in the 60s she would frequent <laughs> the Queen's Cafe in Kilmarnock with the Kelly Tigers Motorcycle Club. Love it. I'm sure the Provost is going to come in after this as well. I'm sure he'll have a comment to say about that. Eh? Me do. <laughs> but I'd like to invite Council today to thank Elsie and show her appreciation for all your hard work and dedications over the years to make football a more inclusive sport and forever championing rights of women and young girls and opening that door moving forward for a truly inclusive sport, East Ayrshire and world of football. So thank you, Elsie. Thank you, everybody. Provis, can I invite you in on the screen if you'd like to say a few words? Thanks very much, Debbie Provis. Hi, Elsie, and I apologise, can't be there. Just recovering. Um, I'm okay now, but the the rest of the family here's got the lurgy. I've been up all night with the wee -in. But anyway, um, uh, thanks for coming in. Uh, I don't know if you know, but pre-COVID we were working on something uh, to do uh, to recognise all your commitment to women's football and something was going to happen pre-COVID, but unfortunately COVID came along. And it's great that you're recognised today and we hope you go, continue to go from strength to strength because the role model that you are to young girls and uh, once that message gets out that lasses can do anything, anything that men can do. Some of the best engineers in the world are women. Uh, just look at women's football. Women's football has exploded and well done to the England team for winning at the highest accolade. And that's young lasses from all walks of life that stepped up and became the best they could be and, and they got the ultimate uh, prize. And that's what you were always pushing all along. Not to mention all the 60s rock and roll stuff. And my mate Swifty wishes you all the best that you met over in Italy at the Scotland game on his bike. But well done. Uh, hopefully I'll catch up with you later on. We'll get a coffee, Elsie. But uh, thanks everyone for uh, giving Elsie the opportunity to, to show uh, what else is all about. Well done. Need the specs on them <laughs> kind of all for this. Oh, well, it was a long time ago this started. Uh, way back in 1958, I was a young 11 year old growing up in a happy place called Stewarton. That's completely changed, by the way. Um, there I discovered Fitbit for the first time and that became a passion. This would demand a huge sacrifice on my part from my husband. Well, my husband was a chauvinist. And I lost my husband through the football because he was against women playing football. Um, I was absolutely skint. I was a single parent with two wee lassies, but the sacrifice was worth it. The rewards were great, absolutely incredible. I have so much to be thankful for. 1958 was my initial introduction to playing football. I was doing the swing part with the boys in Stewarton. I was a tomboy and boys did adventurous things. And I wanted to join in with them. And I was accepted, totally accepted, until now I'm at the age of 11, and today they're playing football. So they line up to pick sides, and I join the line. I went again. Shove it, you, you're a lassie. And lassies can't play football. That's what I go at. It's a boys' game, sneered Jimpy. I was furious, absolutely furious. This was the boys I ran about with. The boys I trusted, we shared everything, but we couldn't, I couldn't play football because I was a lassie. So Shug was laughing at me and I felt like belting him. I stood up tall, I stood my ground and... No buy yet. And see you, Shug. You go and raffle yourself, your poultice. That was my exact words and I can hear them now in my head as I'm talking them, but I get picked. So 1958 was the World Cup in Sweden and the boys were all tight talking animatedly about a young Brazilian called Pele. Oh, I'd never heard this name ever before, um, but they were talking about Pele who scored all these goals for fun. And my actual involvement in the beautiful game began that day with the one name Pele. 
this is 1960 now, and I went to my first real football match, age 13. It was a floodlit game at Rugby Park, Kilmarnock versus Third Lanark. And an introduction to real football for me, it was so exciting. Have you ever been to Rugby Park? It's no exciting anywhere. It was so exciting. <laughs> for a 13 year old that never been to a match before, I was unexpectedly swept away with emotion as I watched Kelly's captain, Frank Beatty, gracefully moving through that midfield in total control of the ball. I was hooked. Frank was my first inspiration. <laughs> 1961, a year later, the town provost in Stuart was a Walter Syme, and Walter had asked my mum to get her netball team together um, to play his works team, Hollywood Bombies, in a charity match to raise funds for the Ethiopia campaign. Well, this was the start of the playing football. The we had no, absolutely no equipment. We begged boots for everybody in the town. The strips we got for Jock Hughes and the, eh, sorry, Jock Roy and the men's team. But we were ridiculed by everybody, including women. <laughs> but Susan Ferris, the Rickerton, soon shut them up because she showed just what a woman could do with a ball at her feet. She was absolutely incredible. And she scored seven brilliant, brilliant goals. No two goals were the same with Susie. Amazing. And um, we won, we beat the Bombies 7 nothing, and that was our first game, our first victory. She shut the doubters up, and Susan was my second inspiration and my most important inspiration. And there and then I made it my mission in life to promote and expand the game, not just for uh, women, but for all ages. And that I did that for the next 33 years. Um, it was really difficult with so many obstacles to overcome and it took a lot of, well, for example, my mission was not only a fight for football, it was about equality, opportunity for women and it took determination, patience and perseverance to promote the girls game and it meant a lifetime of hard work for me. But I had an unfailing belief in my players and the great game of football and I set out to prove the doubters wrong. It was difficult in the 60s in Presbyterian Scotland. You were told a woman's place was in the kitchen. Men were in charge of everything, including our decisions in life. An FA law had been passed in 1921 banning women from playing football, and this meant we couldn't book a pitch. Council pitches as well were excluded. Just a, a beggar's belief, doesn't it? Um, and SFA referees were warned not to officiate at women's games. Wait a minute. <laughs> With so many other obstacles to overcome, no pitches meant no change of facilities. And I'm going to put in here, this is no written down. There was one, one game in particular, we were having a training session at the Howard Park Command, and we changed at the bandstand. And after we re kick about Mankey, we get up to get back into our clays. And just as we were sitting there in our underwear, the church came out via across the road. <laughs> oh my God. And all these women, you could hear them talking to their men. Terrible, terrible. And it was hilarious. But that, we just <laughs> took that on more stride. Um, we had Hunter's, Hunter's obstacles to overcome. No pitches, no change, and finding opposition. We didn't have phones in these days way back. Nobody had a phone in their well, Very few folk had a phone in their house. So finding opposition, finding players, fundraising, transport. Most folk didn't have a car either. And parents didn't want their real asses kicking a ball. So with all these difficulties, we also faced derogatory criticism in the press with the chauvinist, chauvinist newspapers, headlines. There were an up, uphill, sorry, it was an uphill battle. Sorry, I'm got a dry mood. Take your time. In the mid-60s, we picked up some really fantastic local players. As the word spread, there was a women's team in Stuarton. And along came, this is Stuarton Thistle's Jim Baxter, Sandra Walker for Toon Home, Jan Lightby for Parleford Road, Rose Duggan for the Western Road, Betty McIntosh, Boyd Street, Jean Hunter, Chris Huss, 
Linda Kid Belfield, Maggie Fulton Ficklemores, and then along came nine year old Rose Riley. These were all talented players, and they confirmed my hopes that one day there would be women's football, women's world cups, professional leagues. I dreamt about it way back in 1961. Hang on. In 1972, I helped to set up the Women's Association and I became secretary, organising the first international at Greenock, Scotland versus England. And although we lost 3-2 to England, we had arrived. History had been made and two years later, oh gosh, under pressure from my husband, he'd had enough. So I promised I'd resign as secretary, but I was then invited to become Scotland manager. <laughs> oh, and I was daft enough to accept. But this coincided with Willie Allen and the SFA lifting the ban on women. And next day, this is funny, Zenon. Next day, a telephone call to my mother says, and my mother's going, Jordan 2636. And then she's looking at me and she's covering the phone around with, well, covering the phone around with, covering the phone with her hand. And she's going to me, Elsie, it's Jockstein in the phone for you. And I'm going, oh, mother, you're heaving. She went, it's Jockstein for you. I takes the phone and this gruff voice, I'll never forget him, this gruff voice goes, Elsie, Jock's doing here. And he was asking, inviting me to bring the Scotland girls team and a Scotland select to play um, pre-match entertainment before the European Cup tie against Olympiacos. That was a huge landmark. And Jock's doing, oh, what a character. He was such a colossus here, man, and I felt the strength of his presence, his character, as we stood together in the tunnel. And see if he'd asked me to run 100 rooms of the pitch, I would have done it. <laughs> it was just special. Two days later, we flew out to Italy, two friendlies, the second game in the San Siro Stadium. Things were indeed looking up for us. Nearly there. <laughs> In 73 and 76, um, I was invited by Princess Saria of Morocco to play exhibition matches in Morocco to raise funds for the Croissant Rouge, the Red Cross. And we raised thousands and we were so well looked after by the Moroccans. They were absolutely incredible people. Um, but I believed in expansion of the game, especially at grassroots. So I walked out in the SFA. I didn't agree with their policies. They were all each individual team within the SWFA, they were trying to outdo one another by poaching players, poaching the best players for other teams, which in turn, it, it, what was this word I'm looking for? These wee teams would fold if they didn't have their special players in the centre of the park. So it wasn't expanding the game, it was stifling it. So I decided, Expansion at the grassroots level was for me. I walked out in the SWFA and I set up under 9s, 12s, 14s and 16s and we played boys teams. This gave the lasses an edge to their game. Some fantastic wee players and here's one you'll never have heard of this wee lassie. Nine year old Julie Smith. She played her entire career, 27 years with Stuart and she later became Sorry, she was a star with Stuart and she later um, became a star with FC Kilmarnock because Stuart changed their name to FC Kilmarnock. She gained 79 caps and she was the quietest, most unassuming wee lassie. She wasn't even the best player, but she was determined. And there's now a mural hanging up in the kickabout area at Hamden Park. And Julie's featured alongside Soonest right in the middle of this mural. And it's just... You haven't heard her name probably, Julie Smith, but she is one fantastic person and a great player. We had more, oh God, we had so many hilarious adventures and so many talented youngsters over the years. Better recognition and organisation followed. And nowadays parents are proud of their daughter plays football and talented women players are visible in every aspect of the game. And the huge success of the Euros in England has been wholeheartedly lauded by the entire footballing community. They were special. That was a special tournament and the players were special. 
Right, I'm often asked what the highlight was for me. I've been met some of the greats along the way. Pelly, Garincha, Bess, Charlton, Banks, Puskas, Eusebio. But my outstanding highlight has been invited. I'll get emotional here. <laughs> my outstanding highlight was being invited to walk the WFA Cup onto the Wembley pitch prior to the Chelsea Arsenal WFA Cup final 2021. As captain of Stuart and Thistle, alongside Leslie Lloyd, the Southampton captain, we stood there in that tunnel holding hands. We just reached out to one another. And the motion of the day overcame us both. And I had this, can't explain it, like an out of body experience. I felt all my wee lasses for these years were there with me, surrounding me. And these emotions overtook me. And I was a tearful wreck walking onto that pitch. But what an honour. So that's the highlight for me. It's not just the superstars of the game that's important. It's the fact that we lasses are getting the opportunity to play this brilliant game of football. Oh. As Seth Blatter said many years ago, the future of football is feminine and how right he was. So after all that, thank you very, very much for, for today and for listening to the story because all these wee girls deserve to be heard and recognised. Thank you very much. That, that was absolutely immense. Um, and Stomach, I couldn't you tell you about. I'll tell you later if it's just no, 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 no. <laughs> um, And of course, Elsie supported here today by Helen Stewart, um, oh, Elsie's 93 year old aunt, uh, Jim Chapman, who's the Women's Football Development Manager. God, you Jim. Laura Hello. McLaughlin, a Commandant Ladies Club captain, Kirsty Monroe of Commandant Ladies' longest serving player to date. Lisa Miller of Stuart and Ladies and Alana Ashley and Leanne of Stuart and Ladies, welcome um, and thanks for coming along to support Elsie. Would you like to say anything at this point? Is, is this, is my, <laughs> this is my wonderful auntie. <laughs> the first game we played in the first of May, the lineup, well, the defence was Helen Stuart, <laughs> left back, Betty Bennett, my mother, right half, I was centre half. And the left back, sorry, the right back was Auntie Nancy Fleming. So that was two sisters, my mother and me. A comedy act. Was not. Okay. And guess who was in goals, or supposed to be in goals? Do you remember Jimmy Brown, commander goalkeeper? His wife, Nessie, was a netball player and she was put in goals for this game, but she was pregnant. So she had to repeat the game. And so was Auntie Ellis. <laughs> so I was left with two players short. But we managed to be soon embarrassed, didn't we? Yes. Good time. And they were great days. Uh -huh. Stuart was amazing, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And I'm not talking about the FIP team. The town of Stuart <laughs> was amazing. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. So we we'll just have some uh, presentations yeah. for you. Um, so honour and privilege to present oh, you with a certificate of civic recognition for East Ayrshire Council. This is for your services for women's football Thank in Ayrshire and Scotland. Congratulations again. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll just move on. Thank you everybody uh, very much for, 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 for that. What amazing, amazing women um, and our story there is absolutely fantastic. I mean, um, the work through all the years that lady and her team have put in is to be absolutely applaud. Uh, so brilliant. What a lovely lady as well. Some of the stories she was telling us in, in the room just before that, I'm kind of glad she didn't read it on the But uh, amazing, amazing person. So thank you all for that. So we'll just move on to Provost remarks. Um, I'll date on kind of first person here. I'll try my best, uh, Provost. Uh, before I, I, I begin, I'll just um, welcome Alison Wilson, who's the area commander to the meeting this morning, who will be speaking in item five, the local policing plan. So welcome to you, Alison. Hi there. Very welcome. 
No, probably smart's going into um, Wednesday 22nd and Thursday the 23rd of February. It was a cup of tea for MND. We held a coffee morning in the canteen to raise funds for the MND charity. And it was a great success. I thank you to everybody who contributed to that. The catering team kindly supplied the cupcakes and we raised £344.48. Diane Norwood and her staff organised the coffee morning at Rossi House, Cumnock, and they managed to raise £101. Thank you to everybody who helped and donated to such a worthwhile charity. We're arranging the charity events and we'll keep you all posted throughout the years. Park School Burn Supper was on Thursday the 2nd of March. The Provost attended the Burn Supper at Park School and had a great time interacting with the youngsters. He said it was a joy to hear them reciting poems and singing songs. And it's also always a pleasure to go along to Park School and anybody who's visited Park School know how true that is. Smashing bunch of young people and stuff there. The ISIE Awards in London was on Wednesday the 8th of March and the, Prom the Provost attended this where East Ayrshire Council won three bronze awards and one silver. Congratulations to Health and Social Care Partnership, Education and Early Learning and Climate Change. All your hard work has paid off. The Scottish Schools Pipe Band Championships at the William McIlvany campus on Sunday the 12th of March. I know various members had went along to that and it was such a fantastic day at the Schools Pipe Band Championships where it's been a joy to listen to all the talented youngsters and it was honoured to present the prizes. The Robert Burns Academy took second place in the category. Congratulations, it was very well deserved and had positive feedback from organisers and they were delighted with the care and attention received from the staff and pupils at the William McIlvany campus and said East Ayrshire was such a good place to host their awards. That's really lovely. The development young workforce at Robert Burns Academy was on Monday the 13th of March. We had went along to that. Um, it's a Skills Academy launch. And it was great to see how confident the pupils were in the pride in what they have achieved. It's a great opportunity for them and gives them an insight into the world of work and also learn some various skills that they can take out there into the world and apply to different jobs and stuff such as like the briefs and some good ideas that were, were given to that and they've all got their own good ideas of how to, how to move forward with that which is really nice. St Moore's Garden South, Comores, fundraiser for MND charity was held on the 17th of March. Colin Smith, who's the wellbeing activity worker at Biome Communities, emailed to ask if the Provost would go along to their fundraiser in Comores as he wanted to donate the money raised to the MND charity. He had a great afternoon, how generous to everyone. They raised £165 for the charity. Thank you. MND Scotland Parliamentary Reception was held on Wednesday the 22nd of March. The Provost was invited to the reception in Scottish Parliament to hear first-hand experiences of individuals and their family living with MND. The conference was very well attended by people from all walks of life and the event was to raise the profile nationally for a more understanding of this horrible disease. So thank you. So we'll just move on in the agenda um, and Looking at declarations of interest. And I'll move to Julie. Um, so, members, again, at this point on the agenda, we are inviting any members who have any declarations of interest on any of the items on today's agenda um, to, to duly note these. Thank you. Everybody OK? Yeah. OK. Uh, moving on to the previous minutes. So this is Smith and approve a great record of the minutes of council meeting held on the 23rd of February 2033 and 2023. And I'll move as a correct record. Second, deputy. Thank you, Provis. Morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I am looking to Apologies, I'll need to. That's absolutely fine, no, no worries at all. That's OK. Uh, Council Douglas, go No for problem, it. sorry about that, Maureen had an appointment she has to attend to. Um, just that we amend the minute to include potentially, I think, the appendix of the information that was presented to members relative to the various budget options. I think just for openness and transparency, um, I think that might be a, a better reflection of, you know, the result on the day. I think the way it reads is, as we know, there was significant conversation between um, the administration and our own group, um, and there was a lot of backwards and forwards. I think if you read the minute, you would just think we left the room and come back and a deal was done, so to speak, which we know that wasn't the case. So that was all. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Yeah, David. Yeah, thanks, Deputy Provost. Uh, obviously, there, there, there's no 
rules around minutes. I don't think the book of how to draft the perfect minute has ever been been written yet. Um, there's maybe one for the future. Probably not as exciting as, as Elsie's book will be, but <laughs> uh, we can have a go. So we always focus on the outcomes. Uh, at the end of the day, Councillor Mackay raised this point, and to be fair, it's, it's a fair point. Uh, I think what would be proposed would be at the top of page six there, uh, where uh, it refers to the adjournment and rec rec reconvention. Not sure that's a word. We need to check that. Uh, but in relation to, firstly, would be to include the lists or the detail of the proposals that were put forward by each group. We kind of focused on the outcome at the end of the minute in terms of what was agreed. But I think uh, if council agrees, then uh, clearly there, there was likely to be merit in recording the specific proposals, the starting point before we get to the outcome. And that can either be done. Part of the thinking was just in terms of not having an overly long minute, but if members are happy to include that, then we can either set it out at the top of page six where it's referred to the, the measures were outlined, we can specify them, or we can include it in, in an appendix to the minute. But if members are happy for the respective sets of proposals to be included, the starting point before we get to the outcome, that's perfectly appropriate and competent if, 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 if that's the, the view of council. And then I think it's also at the adjournment reconvention would be just to add to the sentence in terms of the meeting adjourned. Uh, and then reconvened, uh, blah, blah, blah. And that would be to allow the um, and members may have their own view of the wording, but maybe propose that the purpose of that was to allow the leaders uh, and their groups to explore the possibility of agreeing a common position, which could then be presented to council for for its consideration. Uh, I don't know if that's sufficient. I'm happy to come and go. But as Councillor Douglas said, it's really just adding a little bit of detail to the process that was followed. I always bang on about the building block approach to good decision making. So there is obviously no harm in recording some of those building blocks rather than just the outcome. So it would be fine to amend the minute as proposed if, if that's uh, the, view, the view of council. We once got accused of being Stalinesque in our approach to the minute. So hopefully we've come a long way since then. That was quite a long time ago. Fashion, but thanks for that, David. A uh, councillor Mamahan. Uh, thanks, David Brovis. I think my, this might be well there. Note we could just maybe make reference to the the video recording as well for the more if they want full detail on that. Make that reference in the minute, and minute, and maybe even more saying that going forward with every minute that's recorded, that uh, the the fuller detail would be in there. Is that so? Through you, Deputy Provost, is that? In addition, you're suggesting Councillor McMahon or an alternative as well as right, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, okay. thanks for that. Um, anything else before we move on? Okay, that's fine. Uh, moving on to agenda item three, it's the Cabinet Committee Minutes. This is to submit for approval is correct records and approval of any recommendations contained therein, with the exception in the minutes of the East Ayrshire Joint Committee, which are here for noting only. We're going to move them one block. Councillor Reid. Yeah, no, so I was, I'll, I'll move because uh, I wasn't in the, the joint meeting, but I'll move on more. So. Second in. Okay, thanks. Is there any corrections or any questions or comments in minutes? Okay, thanks everybody. We'll move on to agenda item number four, and this is the activities of the Governance Scrutiny Committee annual report for 2022, pages 57 to 68 in your report. And I'll invite Councillor Neil Watson to present the report. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost. Um, basically, um, as Councillor uh, Lillian Jones is unwell today, uh, I'm just presenting the report by the Chair of the Governance and Scrutiny Committee um, of the activities um, that have taken place in 2022. Um, they, the report covers areas of activity, call-ins, the internal audit process, uh, anti-fraud strategy, performance and best value, corporate governments, uh, governance and education. Um, and Councillor Jones has also uh, put into place a conclusion uh, of the uh, committee's activities at the end of the report. Thank you, Provost. Thanks, Councillor Watts. Them to get any questions or comments, uh, Councillor Claire Mellon. Um, on paragraph nine on page fifty-eight, 
Um, I thought this was, I just want clarification. I thought this was for the 2022 report, but it has the January 2023 report in it. Thank you. Anybody want to take that? That's a no. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Neil, Neil, do you have any insight on that? Um, no, I'd, I'd, no, I'd probably pass over to David Mitchell because, I mean, what Councillor Maitland is saying is actually correct. There were no call-ins actually in 2022. Um, the call-in that referred to in, in the report was actually, yes, in 2023. Uh, fine. Th thanks, Neil. Um, David? I suppose uh, at one level, as the Chair's report, obviously colleagues uh, we are involved in, in support in terms of the level of detail that's provided. I don't think there was any particular point or purpose being served. I think sometimes, uh, you know, in the absence of any other call and sometimes with these reports, there, there may feel they need maybe felt to include or say something. Uh, I take the point, but again, within the world of legal and governance, there are no rules round about what the content would be. So Councillor Maitland's correct to point out it's, it's the annual report for 2022. Uh, given that I think the original cabinet was January 23, it doesn't fall within that, but uh, I suppose it was just considered to be topical and current. Uh, there are no rules for it to offend or breach, so it's simply a matter for council uh, in terms of what you'd want to do, but I'm not sure that taking it out of the report, uh, and I'm not sure that's been suggested, to be fair. Uh, I think the point's taken. We do generally focus on the year, but I can only finish with it. It's not an exact science. Um, Members are entitled to, to make the point and react as, as they would wish, but I don't think it was there for any other reason than to have something to say around Colin and demonstrate that the committee does provide effective scrutiny at all levels and including the use of the Colin mechanism as and when appropriate, although as members are aware, that's not too frequent. Thanks, David. Uh, Councillor Reid. Well, it's maybe just a change in the title. It's maybe that, you know, it's within the financial year or, or within the time period since that's government, you know, the new government scrutiny did it, was it May, June last year. So, you know, 22, 23, because there's a number of references within the report to 20, uh, 23. So, maybe just the title, you know, so the financial year. You want to come back in, Cliff? Um, I'm, as David said, I'm not suggesting it be removed, but I'm assuming it won't be next year's as well. Thanks. Is that okay with you? Um, Councillor Watts. Uh, yes, and, I, and to be fair, uh, Councillor Reid uh, has has a good point there. I mean, the municipal year as such. So, I mean, um, we, I would be certainly happy if, uh, for the report to say, you know, activities of the municipal year as such, which would be obviously twenty two, twenty three. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, just uh, thinking back to my time as Chair of Governance and Scrutiny, I'm sure because we had one call in in the last term that the same thing happened there. I think it was more just as a flavour to say, you know, there, have, there was no call in decisions, but actually we've just had one. I'm sure it happened. I could be wrong. And that was around education and an education consultation from memory. <clears throat> I mean, I don't quote me on it, but I think that was the case. So I think it was more just to give a flavour as it was topical, as David has suggested. So, but again, that's something to you know take up with Councillor Jones, I suppose, directly. Uh, that, that, that's fair, Councillor Lucas. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Um, two quick points for me, if I may, if my, my voice uh, lasts. Um, <laughs> I, I realise Councillor Jones isn't in chamber today, but I just want to congratulate her on our first term as Chair of Governance and Scrutiny. Um, we may be in different political parties, but it's all, always good to see a, a female in a leadership um, position. And obviously, after we've heard the the very um, emotional journey that Elsie Cook has been on uh, through her lifetime with her football endeavours, um, that just reinforces how important it is that women's voices do get heard. Um, with regards to the report, um, I want to draw people's attention to point 13. Um, high praise indeed for East Ayrshire's um, handling of the COVID grant uh, with the anti-fraud arrangements, which were described as impressive by the Scottish Government Head of Counter-Fraud. Um, 
For me, this is in sharp contrast to the UK government process, where the Conservatives set up a VIP fast lane to award contracts to their friends and political allies. Um, a clear indication that when Conservative ministers are in power, they will put their own priorities over the needs of people. So um, I realise that's a political point, but my main point is well done East Ayrshire for having such a, a good, robust process to look after uh, these grants that were, that were really, really needed when people needed them most during the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Elaine, as you say. Um, congratulations, warranted indeed. Councillor Richardson. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Claire. Uh, no, it was just to, to say, uh, you know, with regards to the date and the report and the information contained within, I think it says in the first, first paragraph there, I mean, to be fair to Lillian, the only survivor of the previous Government and Scrutiny Committee is Councillor Cogley. So to write a full report, to be fair to Lillian, to write a full report on meetings and what happened when you weren't actually part of it would have been difficult. And I think to be fair to Lillian, she's just used the um, the most recent call in about the Howard Park to illustrate maybe what a call in is all about and what happens. So, you know, I, I think the report's great. I mean, the as part of the governance and scrutiny, I think the, the committee is working quite well. Um, I think officers might feel they maybe get scrutinised a wee bit more than they did in the past. I see Joe smiling there because he gets a lot of financial questions. So I think uh, governance and scrutiny is working quite well. And I think the report from Lillian's uh, a fair assessment of what's happened over the last year or so. And maybe it's just a case of changing the dates on it, to be honest. Aye, th thanks very much for that, David. Um, and aye, that, that's a good, a good conclusion. Um, Councillor Cogley. Thank you and good morning. And yes, as the voice of continuity, um, just to say, I think the committee's working really well and that's simply my contribution. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Councillor Cogley. Uh, David Mitchell. Yeah, uh, thanks to, to Councillor Reid and Councillor Watts for, for the support there, but uh, the, the paper has, the approach has always been it is a calendar year, we can look at that for the future and align it with the financial year, it would then be coming in June, but all of that's in the gift of Council, but I wouldn't want to, you know, it's slightly akin, I think, when you're painting the white lines back to the football theme and then, you know, you just move around the obstruction rather than go over it. So I think we accept it's a calendar year, but the point I was going to make is, although it comes to Council, it's also for public consumption. And some of the information in there has maybe better been brought forward than brought out technically correct in a year's time when it's maybe of less less interest. So that, that would be the final point. And, defence of or an explanation of the, the content, but I think otherwise all the other positive comments are, are noted and uh, we'll take on board if, if this can be better aligned to the financial year rather than the calendar year going forward. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Thanks, David. Thanks. Anybody else want to come in? No. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Watts, for, for your report and bringing that in. I um, can appreciate the standing uh, last minute in a day. So um, th thanks very, very much for that. So move on to agenda item number five, which is a local policing plan for 2023 through to 2026. And I'll bring in Ian Tuff. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Good morning, members. And, and just before bringing in uh, Chief Inspector Alison Wilson, who's with us today to, to supplement anything I say, just by way of introduction. So present today the local policing plan for 2023 to 26. This is in accordance with the statutory duty on, on all uh, local authorities under the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act. So I think this is our fourth policing plan coming to Council. It is a matter reserved to the full Council to approve. Uh, the detail has already been considered and approved as well by the Council's own Police and Fire and Rescue Committee at its last meeting. So with those uh, introductory comments, Deputy Provost, I'll see if Alison wanted to add anything as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ian. Um, not really much to add. There's obviously kind of widespread consultation taking place, <clears throat> including community councils, the Community Planning Partnership, the PFRC, the Safer Community um, Delivery Group, the Young People's Cabinet, Community Justice, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Clearly, we're all outlined here in terms of local policing priorities, our areas of focus, and the strategic outcomes. I can touch on in further detail if you would like, but they're all obviously underpinned by public health partnerships, prevention and ill intervention, and also the person centred approach. Um, rather than 
go on at length. Um, is it worth just asking if anyone wants to ask in specifically in relation to areas of the plan? It's fine, Alison, thank you. Anybody want to come in at this point with any questions? I'm doing line. Uh, Councillor Bob. It's, it's not really a question, it's just more of a kind of statement. Uh, I mean, it's, for me, it's been a privilege to be the chair of the Police Fire and Rescue Committee for the past 10 months. It's, the purpose of the committee is to scrutinise the, the police performance, but I found it a great platform uh, to strengthen our partnership working. I mean, we're extremely fortunate in East Ayrshire to have Chief Superintendent uh, Baruch Hussain and the rest of his team. A local police to collaborative in partnership working to a whole new level locally and as members of the PFRC I'm sure will confirm. The committee have been in nighttime drive alongs with Inspector Farmer who provided us with an insight into the daily operations of our local police. These drive alongs gave us a better understanding of the fantastic work our local police uh, carry out seven days a week to keep our communities safe. We also had a visit to the, the Central Command Centre in Govan, where we got to chat to the extremely talented uh, call handling staff. I'd like to thank Lynn Young for organising that. I'd also like to highlight the fantastic work that our own Ian Tuff has done, not only in terms of the work carried out during the consultation uh, process for the, for the local police plan, but also for his knowledge and support to the committee. I mean, this local police plan just like the previous priorities, like serious crime, safer communities, community wellbeing and road safety. But I'm delighted to see uh, violence against women and girls prioritised in this plan. Uh, domestic abuse, rape and sexual assault and child sexual abuse are extremely serious crimes and we must do everything we can to eradicate it. I hope uh, Council will endorse this uh, plan and approve the recommendations in paragraph 2. Graham, thank you very much. Councillor McMahon. Thank you, Deputy Provost. And just to follow up on Councillor Barton's comments around about the violence against women and girls, I'm delighted to see as part of the milestones that supportive trauma informed. I think it's vital that when somebody presents that any officer dealing with them are, 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 is in really trauma informed and the approach that we take around about that. So I'm really, really encouraged about that. And obviously, the removal of the perpetrator and some of the, the other. Uh, laws that have been brought in and they're really taken on board all the way through this paper as far as violence against women and girls. So just uh, delighted to see that trauma informed approach on it. Lovely, Jim. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on this? Councillor Mabin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a compliment and I have uh, a concern in Kilmarnock South. Uh, the local police have been very good working with me. We try to address concerns about parking and unsafe road conditions and, and considerate people in Wat uh, Riggs Primary School. Local police officer has attended with myself and Ayrshire Roads Alliance to, to look at the issues and try and make things safer. So thank you to the local police officers for that. Um, I've got concerns in Belfield way Antisocial behaviour and vandalism have got youngins up on the, the roof of the church down there. So, in, in page 90 of the report, is uh, develop local action plans and initiatives to address antisocial behaviour and disorder in conjunction with partners. So, I'm, I'm wondering if there's any progress in that, which partners we're working with, and can local members definitely be involved in that? Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Hey, Alison? Yeah, I certainly can take that one off the table and discuss the whole partnership approach to it, but we're absolutely committed to reducing antisocial behaviour across the whole East Ayrshire area. Uh, Belfield is, is no less um, attributable to that, so happy to take one off the table and build around about the, the approach that we've got towards reducing ESP. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Is that OK? Thanks, Councillor Mabin. Uh, Councillor Cannon. Thanks, Claire. Um, just really to reiterate what Graham was saying, I think one of the things as a new member which has really impressed me is the is the partnership working we have. I mean, just yesterday morning um, we've had a, an incident with dogs escaping in Comores, and I needed to give further assurance to the community, and I was able to get 
um, access to a senior officer within 10 minutes. Um, this afternoon, Ian Farmer's actually um, coming up to Stuart and on a walkabout with members um, and senior officers to discuss um, antisocial behaviour in um, Stuart and the rest of ANIC just to see what we can do specific to Stuart to improve the situation. So just to say again, I think the partnership working is, is uh, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, Graham. Thanks, Tria. Um, I'm pleased as well to see hate crimes mentioned as well. We need to keep on top of that too. So that's a real good focus here and that the victims feel they get support and can report it and have got every confidence. So I'm really pleased with that as part of the whole report. That's what I want to say. Thanks. I absolutely. Councillor Boyd Hate Crime is a skilled in our communities and um, affects so many people and absolutely should be reported. Councillor Reid. I promise. I'm just wondering if you can maybe ask the Deputy Chief Executive if there's any, uh, any, any developments in following the, the, the budget of the antisocial behaviour team. You know, just if, we, if there's can be any update and when we're going to have a, a report on this and if there's been any kind of progress. Through you, Chair, we've also got Blair here, but yeah, we've been working on this extensively and um, I understand that the job descriptions are all complete. We've got a kind of um, structure in mind now and we're making contact with other local authorities through a lot show to look at our approaches and operations. And so we hope to pull together our East Ayrshire approach within the next few weeks and come back and present that to you. Um, we, we hadn't decided whether what way to come through. We were going to link the spokesperson first in terms of whether it would be a wider elected member briefing or whether it would be through a, a cabinet because we already have approval. But yes, well underway and we've got a lot of um, really good um, progress there. So we're looking forward to working alongside Alison and her team to bring that to life. Blair, I don't know if I've missed anything. Yeah. Love to hear, Katie. Thank you. OK, Provis. Thanks very much, Deputy Provis. And, uh, just to ask, uh, Alison, um, in terms of uh, the motorcycles that we uh, invested in uh, with uh, within East Ayrshire for the police to use, if there's any outcomes yet, uh, any indication of how well or if there's been a success, I know it's very early and if that information is not available, I'll wait to uh, later on in the year. Um, but um, if she could give us a wee uh, insight to that. And also, uh, just what Katie's been talking about, um, we know that RSLs, and there's a lot more RSL houses getting built now. And um, I know for a fact Atrium Cunningham are, are really looking at uh, antisocial behaviour teams. And I know we do that across uh, working with uh, the, the other antisocial behaviour teams. But um, uh, would it be worth having a, a semi-formal um, committee uh, where, uh, uh, you know, into Peter's suggestion that, uh, a very good suggestion that um, councillors may want to get involved with uh, maybe regular meetings with antisocial behaviour officers, not just with the council, but with RSL officers and police as well. Thank you. Thanks, Provis. So just in relation to the motorcycles, I don't have connectivity to my own database at the minute, unfortunately, but we do keep a running log in terms of the amount of offences that have been detected utilising the motorcycles. Um, certainly really, really effective from my point of view. We've traced the high-risk missing people as a result of using them that we would never normally be able to access that type of terrain, or it would have taken us much longer to do so had we not had access to it. And there's also a number of antisocial behaviour linked um, areas where we've ticketed people in relation that as well but if you just bear with me and give me some time post meeting I can certainly share the kind of run log that we've got in terms of those offences and incidents we've been involved in. Thanks Alison. Katie? Yeah through you Chair thanks to the other point that the province raised there we already have councillor conversations in the diary and I know we're theming one coming up on antisocial behaviour but the work that Blair and the team are leading we can certainly look at good practice and making sure that we've got that network of anti -be antisocial behaviour response and um, Ian beside me here is also thinking that we'll make good links in with the police and fire committee around this as well so that there's good updates so we'll figure out what the shape of this looks like and then we'll look to see how we engage but the I think we've got a date the diary for our um, next police conversation which is absolutely focused on antisocial behaviour and we're going to use that as a focus to really shape the team and the network so if, if Provis will bear with us and that we'll be able to to involve them in that process. Thanks very much for that Katie and, and Alison. Uh, Councillor Cowan. 
Thank you, Chair, but I think Katie's maybe just answered my question. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the community wellbeing unit that has been set up, and I realise that probably is discussed in detail at the uh, Police and Fire Rescue uh, Committee, but for other councillors, I'm wondering what opportunities there are to get a bit more detail, whether that is through um, an elected member seminar or perhaps through the, the community planning partnership to do a sort of deeper dive in, into into that sort of definitive work that the police is doing in our communities would certainly be welcomed by myself. Thank you. Thanks for that, Elaine and um, Katie Smith and um, Alison. Yeah, so just to say, um, so Inspector Ian Murray was the previous inspector who headed up the Community Wellbeing Unit. He's just recently retired and I'm pleased to announce that today we've got a new successor appointed for him. So more than happy to do a presentation or in terms of just sharing that digitally in terms of a, a kind of update document in terms of the work they're involved in. Very much preventative focused and trying to improve wellbeing within the communities. But um, it's been going for about 12 months now approximately, but having some real good inroads. So yeah, really happy to get involved with that, Councillor. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Alison. Anybody else like in? Councillor Mackay. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Deputy Chief Executive, as well. And I think I would want to pick up on uh, Councillor Canning's point uh, in terms of the partnership working. And it really it works in very much. It's a two way process as well. And I know, again, some of the work that uh, within your, your staff, uh, Deputy Chief, uh, have done in terms of actually managing to enhance people's uh, living experiences in two particular areas very recently that had given us grave concern in terms of antisocial behaviour and if the partnership had not worked as well as it has with the police that would have been a much more difficult ask uh, and I know that we have uh, been had positive uh, terminations uh, of tenure uh, for for two for two residents, and that was a very positive outcome. And that's about the the partnership working that has been achieved. Uh, also, uh, one of our members, who unfortunately due to ill health is not able to be here today, had raised the question in terms of uh, previous policing plans and highlighting the issue of trafficking. Uh, which uh, has been an issue. Now, I'm not sure if that would be taken under the headings uh, that you feel that you've already got there, but just ask for a comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. So that would fall under the serious crime and potentially violence against women and girls, dependent on what Ada Kajafkin can cover kind of spectrum of different um, activity and offences. So it very much is contained within um, serious crime and violence. So I would suggest we obviously consult quite widely in relation to what the communities feel is important for them in terms of the survey, etc. So I would very much say it's encapsulated within the serious crime aspect. Thanks. Thanks for Alison. Thanks, Councillor McKay. Hi. Uh, Drew Felson. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Uh, just looking for a wee bit of reassurance for, for Alison. Uh, page 79 at the bottom paragraph there, uh, the five policing hubs. Uh, just a wee while ago there, there's quite a wee bit of rumour going about Dome Ellington that the uh, police department was looking at uh, moving the Dome Ellington police hub to Cumnock and would have a response for Cumnock. So I'm just hoping this is not the case. Yeah, I can absolutely confirm, Councillor Fulton, that's not the case. So Wellington will be maintained. As you know, we're in a partnership building there, which needs to change um, during the time of decant, which will be very lengthy, actually. Um, we will maintain a hub within Dom Ellington, which will be co-located alongside Hale. So just to provide you assurance there, that will be maintained. Thanks very much, Alison. Great reassurance there. Anybody else want to come in? Just a wee note and a comment. Just uh, before it arrives on Saturday, we're police got on happy birthday. They'll be 10 years old and on Saturday. So, <laughs> what they mention. Absolutely. Happy birthday. Um, anybody else? Anyway, all happy to agree the report. Smashing. Thanks very much for that, Alison. So we move on to item number six, home, over, uh, home owners service officer working group, and I'll pass to Helen Merriman if you have a look at pages 104 to 109 in your report. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Good morning, 
members and colleagues. The purpose of this report is to recommend that a short life homeowners service member officer working group is established to conduct a review of the role of the homeowners service and its powers in relation to administering and enforcing private landlord registration relative to current legislation in advance of the publication of the final Scottish Government Rented Sector Strategy in order to identify any gaps in current practice. Recommendations are noted at paragraph two. To provide members with background, in December 2021, the Scottish Government published a New Deal for Tenants draft strategy consultation paper which sought views on how a new deal for tenants can be delivered to progress the right to an adequate home and deliver housing to 2040. The draft strategy aims to ensure all tenants in private and social rented homes are able to access secure, stable, affordable tenancies, whilst also benefiting from good quality homes and receive professional levels of service from their landlord. The draft strategy acknowledged that the private rented sector has greater potential for review than the social sector, and therefore the majority of policy proposals were in relation to the private rented sector. The key actions identified in the draft strategy to deliver improvements in the private rented sector are noted at paragraph four. The consultation ran from December 2021 until April 2022 and enabled the Scottish Government to gather input and views from a range of stakeholders, including tenants and landlords, as well as stakeholders across the rented sector, so that positive actions could be identified while seeking to mitigate challenges. The Scottish Government commissioned independent analysis of the consultation responses and the analysis report was published in August 2022, outlining a number of key findings related to the private rented sector, which are detailed at paragraph six. Paragraphs seven and eight discuss a function of the Council's homeowner service is to conduct the administration and enforcement of private landlord registration for the local authority. This is a statutory duty under the Antisocial Behaviour etc Scotland Act of 2004 to allow local authorities to hold a register of all private landlords in the area. The service also provides a range of general advice and assistance to both private landlords and tenants, including information relating to landlord registration, understanding tenancy agreements and bringing empty homes back into use. The service works closely with other council departments as well as local landlords and letting agents with regards to inspecting a property relative to the repairing or tolerable standards. In advance of the publication of the final Scottish Government's Rented Sector Strategy, Housing Services is looking to establish a short life member officer working group to conduct a review of the role in relation to private landlords and the powers in relation to administering and enforcing private landlord registration relative to current legislation. The proposed terms of reference for the private sector housing member officer working group are set out at Appendix 1 of the report. Within policy and community planning implications, the work of the service supports the vision and priorities within the East Ayrshire Community Plan and associated delivery plans. There are no legal implications arising from this report. Any legal implications as a result of the final Scottish Government Rented Sector Strategy will be implemented as required. There are no human resources, equality, financial risk or net zero implications. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much for Helen. Uh, for that, Helen. Anybody got any questions or comments on this? Councillor Cogley. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, I'm slightly confused here. There was a private sector working group that was due to have its, this was a member officer working group, that was due to have its first meeting on the 27th of February. And the, the elected members that were to be included were myself, councillors Reed, Jones and McFadgen, uh, working with Jessica McRobert, Dawn Cadwell and Elaine Kavner. And the Helen, this was um, a, an email from yourself 
stating at the first meeting the terms of reference would be agreed. Now, is this in place of, is what you're proposing here in place of that, is it working alongside it? Um, or has whatever this group was going to be, has that been changed? Um, I'm not, I wonder if you could clarify that, please. Thanks, Councillor Cogley. Brian, David Mitchell. Yeah, just, just to clarify, Councillor Cogley, that it is the same group. Uh, unfortunately, the, the initial approach had slightly strayed off the, the governance path in that it falls to Council to agree to delegate authority and functions to a member officer working group. And again, by legislation rather than internal governance under the 1973 Act, it falls to Council to make those appointments. So this is the formal approach being taken to set up the private landlord. I appreciate that the, the homeowner service has been referred to, but this is the same group. Uh, it just got a little bit ahead of itself in terms of the arrangements that were put around previously. And obviously on reflection, having a, an officer at grade 10 chairing a member officer working group wasn't really going to work. So uh, colleagues uh, in discussion, we adopted the same approach as we've done with every other member officer working group, which was bring the paper to council and invite Council to delegate the function, grant the, 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 the authority and to, to populate, uh, agree the composition. Normally it sets a high level terms of reference and the groups can always develop that further. It's not prescriptive and it's certainly not restrictive, but in terms of governance, it, it takes a council uh, decision to set up a member officer working group and appoint the members to it uh, for it to, to function in accordance with, with, with uh, legal and governance requirements, mainly the 1973 Act. So this is what you were expecting but this is it uh, through the, the formal process and obviously colleagues will move to set up the first meeting in early course should council agree arrangements today. Thanks David, you want to come back in Sally? Yes, thank you, thank you. Right, okay, I completely accept that as a matter of courtesy. It would actually have been useful to have, um, to, to have known that at the time that whatever the previous group was going to be uh, when that was stood down, thank you. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Lloyd. Thanks. Uh, can I make, maybe make a suggestion? But given the wider remit that, uh, of this committee, and that we look at the composition to reflect the balance of the council, make it uh, three from my group, two from the Labour group, and one from the Conservative, and one from the other members. Uh, so that'd be seven rather than five. David. Absolutely. Again, I keep saying the phrase today is no exact science, but there is the, the companion piece to how to write the perfect minute in terms of how to form the perfect member of the working group is still to be written as well. So there are no rules, whether it's five. Five reflects our previous practice because it worked in the past, but as the composition of council changes, it's absolutely in council's gift to change the composition of the member of the working group. So seven is entirely competent and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Thanks, David. Molly Mackay. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very happy with that. Uh, and our named members on that group would be Councillor Lillian Jones and Councillor Barry Douglas. Thanks, Councillor Mackay. Councillor Reid. Just and, and from our side, the earth three will be uh, councillors Lane Cowan, Ian Linton, and Neil Ingram. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Anybody else want to come in at this point? I've not got my specs on. Councillor <laughs> McFadden. Uh, just to say, I'll be the member for our group. The independents are happy with uh, Councillor Cogley taking the independents position. Lovely. That's us. Thank you. Really done. Yeah, great. Th thanks very much, everybody. Um, Thank you. Right, we'll move on to agenda item number seven, which we're looking to appoint a representative to Business Loan Scotland, and I'll bring in David McDowell. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Provost and members. Uh, the purpose of this report is to appraise members of the proposed appointment of an officer to represent the Council on the Board of Directors of Business Loan Scotland. By way of background, Business Loan Scotland is the fund manager for the Scottish Government's £15 million loan fund, which seeks to invest in new and growing Scottish SMEs. Business Loan Scotland works with all 32 local authorities in Scotland and also with a range of private and public sector partners, including banks, chambers of commerce, Prince's Trust, Scottish Enterprise, Business Gateway and Skills Development Scotland. 
The fund supports micro finance, loan and equity support via the Scottish Growth Scheme and Business Loan Scotland offer loans from 25,000 to 250,000 with a fixed interest rate of 7%. Support to businesses is uh, provided from a dedicated loan officer as well as advice and training from the Business Gateway and our own business support teams. As a seven strong team is based in East Ayrshire at the Ingram Enterprise Centre, this integration with the Business Gateway and Business Support Team provides a one-stop shop for SMEs. As a result of personnel changes within economic growth, uh, the, there now exists a vacancy on the, uh, the, the, the actual board and Business Loan Scotland contacted the Council inviting it to nominate an officer or elected member to sit on the board. Following discussions with the Council Leader around the operational activity of the Board's role, it is proposed to nominate the Economic Development Strategic Manager to act as the Council's representative at the quarterly meetings uh, on the Business Loan Scotland Board to create the partnership links between the Business Loan Scotland team and the business support teams, ensuring uh, continuing alignment with the aims and objectives uh, of the Council and the Regional Economic Strategy. Deputy Provost, the recommendations are set out in paragraph two, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, David. Anybody got any questions or comments? Councillor Mackay. Thanks. It, it's not a question for uh, David, I don't think. It's a question for the leader. Uh, we note in the paper that uh, you were consulted, uh, leader, and proposed to nominate Mags Watson. I think at some point in the past, the, the opportunity has been there for this to be an elected member or an officer. Um, was there a particular reason to change from, I think in the past we had had an elected member, I think it was Councillor Cook at some point, I know it had been an officer. Was there a, a particular reason this time to, to stick with the, the officer route? It's not. I mean, I discussed it with uh, David, and uh, you know, just uh, it seemed to be more operational rather than, uh, matters that were being dealt with rather than you know something that needed a, a political steer, uh, and it can all always feed back into the various uh, council committees, uh, cabinet, and uh, GNS if necessary. Uh, so I was quite happy with it. That was the recommendation I was given. So, and that's the practice I believe with uh, other most other councils. Uh, so. Just went along with that. Okay. Thank, thanks, Dougie. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Anybody else want to come in? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for presenting that, David. Move on to agenda item number eight. What is um, appointment of additional members to East Ayrshire local licensing forums? This is pages 113 to 116 in your reports. And I'll bring in David Mitchell. Thanks, Deputy Provost and members. Uh, I've said before, this is almost a, a standing item in Council now, but that just reflects, unfortunately, the kind of turnover we have in the in the membership, A, because it is quite a large uh, and wide ranging spectrum of, of membership, and uh, B, unfortunately, we we are having issues in retaining folk as well. So I've got a meeting next week with colleagues uh, to consider. There was correspondence recently from the Community Safety Minister uh, on a national basis to all councils in terms of now we're coming out of COVID, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. This is one of the areas they would want us to revisit and seek to refresh. So we'd already been having those discussions with the existing forum members in terms of what we can do along with Councillor Filson as Chair of the Licensing Board and we have have some ideas around uh, a, a, a fresh or a refreshed approach to community engagement um, through the community councils and other community groups on an ongoing basis. So uh, hopefully members will see a little bit more activity around there. Um, in terms of the future activity work of the forum. But in the meantime, we have on the back of the last uh, ask, if you like, or the last uh, exercise in trying to recruit further members, had uh, these two further applications from, and the details are at paragraph eight, Melanie Gibson, who's a personal license holder, and Andrea Whip, who, who is, I think, a manager in, a, in, in, in the store there, uh, referred to, uh, have put themselves forward. Uh, so therefore, uh, with that length introduction, it's, it's for Council to hopefully approve those appointments to the forum today uh, and to set us on our way as we try and breathe some fresh life into the activities of the forum as we go forward. Thanks very much for that, David. Anybody got any questions or comments? 
I'm just happy with that, David. Thanks very much. Members, that concludes the business for the council meeting. I'll now draw the meeting to a close and the recording will now finish. I hope you all have a lovely Easter holiday, although I know we'll still be working hard in our communities. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>